Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, what is the personality trait model of diagnosing personality disorders in the DSM? If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. That way you won't miss anything new. Now, when we consider personality disorders in the DSM, we of course know that there are sections on categorically diagnosing these disorders. For example, a number of symptom criteria and so many of those symptom criteria must be fulfilled in order to qualify for a diagnosis. Now in the DSM, there's also an alternative model based on personality traits. We could argue that this is an approach to be more dimensional rather than categorical in terms of diagnosing. And the alternate model can be used instead of the categorical model under certain situations. For example, if the categorical model of personality disorders doesn't quite match up to the needs in the assessment. This is also just really a proposed set of criteria and a proposed methodology. So it's something that's still being worked on, but right now it is available to use, as I mentioned, under certain situations. So first to understand this personality trait model, we have to understand the general criteria for personality disorder under this model. So here we see two main criteria and then a few other criteria we'd have to consider. The two criteria that really stand out here would be A and B. Criterion A says that there needs to be moderate or more severe impairment in personality functioning, and criterion B indicates that you would need to have one or more pathological personality traits. And then we see other criteria, and these are like some other sets of criteria we see in other places in the DSM, including that this impairment that's referred to in criterion A must be inflexible and pervasive. The personality traits need to be stable and the onset needs to be traced back to adolescence or early adulthood. We also see that the disturbance can't be better explained through another mental disorder or through substance use or from a medical condition and the disturbance would not be considered normal for the developmental stage or for the socio-cultural environment. Now using this alternative model based on personality traits, only six personality disorders can be diagnosed. So from cluster A, we see only schizotypal. So no schizoid and no paranoid personality disorder there. From cluster B, we see antisocial, narcissistic and borderline, and not histrionic. And from cluster C, we see avoidant personality disorder, obsessive compulsive personality disorder, and not dependent personality disorder. Now, in using this model to diagnose one of these six personality disorders that is included, the first criterion, criterion A, is fairly straightforward. It's the same criterion across all six of those personality disorders. And that would be two or more elements of what they call identity, self-direction, empathy, and intimacy. So this is the impairment category. Now, criterion B, that's a little different. That varies depending on the personality disorder and there are varying numbers of pathological personality traits for the personality disorders. And this is the feature that really stands out with this personality trait model. Now in this personality trait model, we see five main traits and a number of facets under each of these traits. And this trait model corresponds fairly well to the five-factor model, although there are some important differences. Now we look at the five-factor model of personality, we know, of course, there are five traits there, and we remember them by the acronym OCEAN. Openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and eroticism. So we see the five traits here for this personality trait model are fairly similar. Now with the first trait, we have negative affectivity. So this is similar to neuroticism, or the opposite of emotional stability. Really, neuroticism and emotional stability represent the same trait, just opposite ends. They're conceptualizing opposite ends of that trait. So we could think of negative affectivity as more related to neuroticism, and we see a number of facets here under it, like emotional ability, anxiousness, and hostility. Now, the next trait is detachment, and this would be considered to be the opposite, really, of extroversion. So that's the trait that is aligned with detachment. And here we see a number of facets, including withdrawal and intimacy, avoidance, and depressivity. The next trait is antagonism, and we consider this to be similar to agreeableness. Again, 
more like a low level of agreeableness, like disagreeableness, but it's the same trait. And we see a number of facets here, like manipulativeness and grandiosity and callousness. Next, we have disinhibition. And this would be considered similar to conscientiousness, again, a low level of conscientiousness. So we see facets like irresponsibility, impulsivity, and risk-taking. Now, the last trait is the one that really diverges from the five-factor model quite a bit. This trait is referred to as psychoticism. And here we see only three facets, unusual beliefs and experiences, eccentricity, and cognitive and perceptual dysregulation. So normally, because this is the last trait and all the other traits are accounted for, we would think that this is similar or supposed to be similar to openness to experience. And there is one facet on openness to experience that lines up somewhat with psychoticism, and that's the imagination facet. But even really here, it's a fairly weak relationship. So when I think of psychoticism in terms of a trait and openness to experience as a trait, I really think of these two as not aligned hardly at all. So four of the traits line up pretty well with the five-factor model, negative affectivity, detachment, antagonism, and disinhibition. And the last one, psychoticism, really doesn't. So as I mentioned, this trait model would be applied to the six personality disorders that are covered in this section. And I'm not going to go through all these, but just a few quick examples of what we might see in terms of the traits and facets represented. In antisocial personality disorder, there are two traits represented, antagonism and disinhibition. So we see facets like callousness, which is from antagonism, and deceitfulness and hostility, also from antagonism, and from disinhibition, we see impulsivity. Now, if we move over to a diagnosis like borderline personality disorder, here we see that there are three traits represented, disinhibition, antagonism, and negative affectivity. Now, a few of the facets are the same as what we see with antisocial personality disorder, like impulsivity and hostility. But then there are some that are different, like separation and security and depressivity, both from negative affectivity. So with each of these six personality disorders, you'll see different traits and facets represented and different numbers would be required. So for example, with antisocial personality disorder, six of the seven facets are required. I hope you found this description of the personality trait diagnostic model for personality disorders in the DSM to be interesting. Thanks for watching.